John, I moved the mic up. Can is it better now? Oh, I'm sorry, the pulpit mic. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yes. Great to be back again. And uh, today, if we look back, see that we are at the end here. We are at our last church, Laodicea today. And I hope this has been a great summer study for us. And uh, maybe even a reminder uh, with seeing these churches in scripture of uh, really the important message that Jesus has to say. And again, uh, with, with studying a, a, a sermon series like this and going through it of the future, right? End times, revelation. But mostly using this as an opportunity for application here today in this age of grace. It's been certainly a, a fun thing doing. And uh, as I've been planning the rest of the 2024 preaching calendar, uh, I really start uh, really started to think of what's going on next uh, as far as what I could preach next. And uh, what's coming to my head is Jonah. Uh, Jonah. So I'm not quite sure exactly what I'm going to do with Jonah, but if you recall, I preached a sermon on Jonah back in September during our Minor Prophet sermon series. And uh, just a couple weeks ago at our Wednesday night Bible study, we looked at Jonah. And uh, again, I'm not sure if we're going to do verse by verse or theme by theme, uh, but there's so many great life lessons that we can learn from Jonah. And uh, the Lord has certainly put Jonah on my heart. Uh, but again, we still have one church left for us to look at here in this study of the seven churches. And looking back to three weeks ago, not two, but three weeks ago, when I was talking about the church of Sardis, I started off talking about the dangers of going through the motions. That's how I opened up this sermon for us to look at. And uh, as I brought up time again, time and time again in that sermon, the most dangerous part about going through the motions is that our heart isn't all in. Our heart isn't all in of what we are trying to accomplish when we're just up there, not really investing our minds and our hearts in the gospel. And I'd like to add another word here to our vocabulary this morning, and this is going to be the word lukewarm. Lukewarm. And uh, I have a picture here on uh, our screen of just a barometer here of, uh, there we go, cold, hot, warm's kind of in the middle, or lukewarm. And uh, the word lukewarm is actually a way to describe food. If you look in the dictionary and look at lukewarm, it's talking about food, uh, temperature-wise, hot food, uh, food that should be hot, but simply isn't. Food that's just a little warm. We've all had soup before, right? Soup that's just a little bit warm. And deep down, we know that the temperature of that soup should be temperature-wise pretty hot, not just warm. And we may even spit it out because of the re that reality of how this isn't what soup is supposed to be like. And during the Beatitudes, Jesus makes a food analogy to his followers. When he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, you, you followers, you believers, you are the salt of the earth. Then Jesus says, but if the salt lose saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out. In the very next verse, he makes another analogy, saying you believers are the light of the world. Nobody puts a lamp under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to everyone that's in the house. So think about it. Imagine if that salt is only 50% salty. Or that light bulb is only 50% bright. 50% for salt and 50% for light might as well be zero. 50% salt and 50% life just isn't going to cut it. It's not even close to the same real deal as 100%. You can't compare 50% salt with 100% salt or a 50% light bulb with a 100% light bulb. It's truly night and day. And the church of Laodicea, like Sardis, was going through the motions. It was neither hot nor cold. Not salty, 
not sweet, not bright, nor dim. It was simply lukewarm. And because of them being lukewarm, Jesus gives probably his most aggressive punishment yet to the seven churches. And that's that he will spit them out of his mouth. Let's read about this charge here. Turn with me to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. For John writes, And to the angel of the church in Laodicea write, The words of the Amen, faithful and the true witness, the beginning of God's creation, And now this is Jesus talking here. He says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. With that, you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see those whom I love. I reprove and discipline to so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne, as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Okay, so for one last time in this sermon series, we have to see how John introduces the Lord Jesus before Jesus speaks and gives us one last final charge. And if we look uh, to what he says, he says, of what John says about Jesus, he says that these are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness. And even he says the beginning of God's creation. We think of how John 1.1 opens up. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was God. And the Word was with God. As you saw briefly with the Scripture reading, and and as we'll see shortly to the charge of Laodicea, you know, Laodicea was worldly. It was of the world. It was neither faithful nor true to living out the Gospel message. But Jesus himself is the faithful and true one who has always existed, firstborn over all creation, as the Apostle Paul says in the book of Colossians. Faithful, true, beginning, existing before the foundations of the world. He was not created, for he has always been. So let's see here. Let's look to uh, what Jesus has to say about this church. And uh, if we look back in our Bibles to, to verse 15 of our text here, he says, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. With that, you are either cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither no- cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth. This is really going to be a big chunk of our sermon here today. Earlier, I brought the example of soup. That was the food example that I gave, that we've all had warm soup that's supposed to be hot, and it's just not the same. It's just kind of warm. And here in the summertime, a nice cold glass of water also, too, is something that's just so refreshing to drink in the middle of the afternoon. But what if 
that cold glass of water isn't cold, but it's actually kind of warm. Same thing. You might actually spit that water out of your mouth. If you were hoping for cold water, at least, and got that kind of warm water. And I'm sure the Laodiceans understood this picture of what Jesus was trying to make here. And if you really pause and think about this for a moment, lukewarmness is a picture of two vast opposites meeting in the middle for a compromise. Cold, hot, meeting in the middle. It tries to play that middle game in hope that it pleases everyone. Not too hot, not too cold, and not too cold to be hot, and not too hot to be cold. And that may sound like a good theory, making everyone happy, but in trying to be both things, they actually end up being nothing. And hearing those words from Jesus, I will spit you out of my mouth. And your translation might even say, I may vomit you out of your mouth. And in saying all this, Jesus wanted them to stop believing and stop embracing this deceptive lie that playing the middle game is the answer. One foot in the world, one foot in the church. Because Jesus knows that being lukewarm ultimately believes that means that you're trying to please both the world and pleasing himself. Okay? One foot saying, I'm living my life to please Christ, while the other foot is saying, I'm living my life to please the world. So what did Jesus say in his earthly ministry? He says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So in other words, if you were too cold, if you were too cold on one end of the spectrum, the world will love you as its own because the world is cold. But you aren't too cold. You're hot, right? At least believers are called to be hot. You're on fire for me, right? Therefore, if the world hates you because your temperature is radically different from the others and the other expectations, that's a lot different. That's something new, right? So if believers are called to be hot and on fire, of course it's going to look different than the ice coldness on the other side of the spectrum. And because that type of attitude makes the world upset, because you're one of those Christians, one of those Christians on the other side, it also makes Christ upset too if you still have that one foot in the world, that one foot in the coldness, that one foot in its sins, in that way of thinking. There's a famous New Testament uh, scholar uh, I was reading this past week when I had some free time, Leon Morris. I was looking at Laodicea, and he said, um, when lighting on lukewarm Christians, he said, hot water heals, cold water refreshes, but lukewarm water is useless for either purpose. So essentially, that's what Jesus is saying here. If they were cold, they were too much in the world, he could still minister to them, right? He could still evangelize to them. If they were so entrenched in the world, he could still share the gospel. He could still evangelize. He could still have hope in his heart that they would change their ways and come to Christ. He could still help them see the truth and help them come back on the path of life. And if they were too hot, living for him, striving to be like him, then that's great. You could reward them and encourage them and, and preach a message of encouragement to keep being on the path that they were already on. But they were on neither path. Because they were neither cold nor hot, Jesus can't really do anything with them except spit them out of his mouth. A word that comes to my head when reading about the church of Laodicea is this word right here, religion. Religion. The church of Laodicea, they had their religion. They went to church. Maybe they loved going to church. Maybe they loved being a good person and doing all the good things that good people do. 
they also had the world. They participated in worldly things. They talked like the world. They acted like the world. They resembled the world, but still identified as a follower of Christ. And the one thing that's missing for that entire thing is Christ himself. The one thing religion misses is the Savior hanging on that cross. I never once mentioned Christ when talking about this lukewarm church because right, them having an authentic love and passion for Christ wasn't present in their lives. A love and a passion for him did not exist in the lukewarmness of Laodicea. And so the truth is, deep down, there's no one more miserable than the lukewarm Christian. Because think of it. They have so much of the world. They have too much of the world to make them happy in it. Right? They have too much of me, myself, and I to ever be content. But they also have too much religion to find peace in the world. Because religion doesn't offer what Christ offers. So they have the world that won't make them happy, but they also have religion, which also won't make them happy because religion is not Christ. Jesus doesn't ask us to make a checklist and have us cross off how many times or put a check mark of how many times a day we do Christian things. But instead, he asks for our heart to be transformed, for our hearts to be transformed and conformed to his image. Will we do that perfectly? No. But will we do that really? Yes. And yes, there is a future church of Laodicea in whom this letter is addressed to and written in. As we talked about with Sardis, the church that was going through the motions a few weeks ago, there's plenty of Laodicean churches here even in this age of grace. Right? There's even some, as I've traveled the country before, there's even some grace churches who have a little bit of Laodicean spirit to them. What this may look like, too, is Bible studies. It was not a lot of passion, not a lot of energy. Priorities mixed up. And other times, even worldly activities picked over the gospel and evangelism and, and sharing the beautiful message of Christ. And the point is, with this congregation, with this future church of Laodicea, if they love church enough to continue attending, can you continue to be involved in, but not enough to actually live for Christ, to live for holiness, that the Spirit of God transform them out of the world and into his saving hand. Not enough to put their faith and their love in a Savior that died for their sins and to live out that message. Getting spit out from the mouth of Jesus is again, it's really the consequence here. It's the consequence for this type of living. Moving on to my second big point of our message here, it's that uh, we have to ask ourselves, what did Jesus have against this church? We've, we've covered a lot so far here already, but according to Jesus, if we look back in our Bibles in, uh, in verse 17 here, the Laodicean said, or at least they maybe had the attitude of, I'm rich, I'm prosper, I don't need anything, I'm just fine, everything's fine, we're fine, we're doing okay things. And in saying that, they realized, they failed to realize that they were actually wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked is what our text says. And the truth is that this future Laodicean church they put their trust in the material things, the outward luxury. They felt like they didn't need anything. This was their attitude. It's fine. Everything in my spiritual life is fine. But Jesus didn't see that. They may saw that in themselves, but it's not what Jesus saw. He saw something totally different, which really spoke to their blindness. What he saw was that, spiritually speaking, they were wretched. They were miserable people. 
They were poor. They were blind of the truth. You have to understand that this is what Jesus saw in them of being more important significance than themselves. So I guess wording that a little bit differently. We have to understand that what Jesus sees is more important to what they see. And even in our lives too, we may have this attitude. Yes, this is what they had this attitude, but we sometimes might have this attitude of everything in our spiritual life is fine. I'm, I'm doing the things I need to be doing. I'm, I'm living for Christ. But what if, what if Christ is calling us and that Holy Spirit that lives inside of us is saying, actually, things are not fine. You can do more. You can live for me more. You can give this part of your life that you won't give to me. You can slowly give that over to me. Again, very easily said than done. There's areas in which I'm still learning. And if I'm still learning, I would imagine you are still learning. And I would, I would imagine that other churches are still learning and other pastors are still learning of what it means to realize there's still work to be done in my heart. There's still things that aren't fine in my life that I'm doing. But I need to give over to the Savior, the Savior that loved me enough to die for me. Remember the second church we looked at two months ago already, the church of Smyrna. Remember that church? That church was near perfect. That was probably our best, if not second best one, because Philadelphia was pretty good a couple weeks ago. But Smyrna, they were near perfect. Though, remember, they thought they were poor, because financially they were poor. But in reality, Jesus said they were actually rich, because they were rich in the spiritual sense. Here's a little bit different of a twist here with Laodicea. They believed they were rich, but actually, these Laodicean people were poor. So, application time here. What does Jesus want the Laodiceans to do? Well, in verse 18, he says something interesting. He says, to buy gold from him, to buy white garments, to clothe themselves, to, and to anoint their eyes so that they can see. And really, this is the solution to their current state receiving his gold so that they could be spiritually rich, clothing themselves in his pure, righteous, right garments to clothe their nakedness, to receive him, Jesus, to help of their healing and giving, sorry, helping Jesus give them spiritual sight so that they would be able to see through the lens in which God wants them to live their lives. And even uh, jumping down here to seeing how he closes all of this, he closes us with painting a picture. And uh, this literal picture has been easy to find because there's a similar picture in the Gospels throughout Christian art throughout the centuries. And it's this picture of him knocking. Knocking. And this, necessar this isn't necessarily only for the Church of Laodicea to see here of him knocking. This is also, I believe, anyone who is reading to see him knocking. We see this picture right here. It's easy for us to imagine. Many Christian art have had this picture because again, in Matthew, I think six, there's a passage about him knocking. So the million dollar question that we have to ask ourselves if Jesus is knocking is, are we going to let him in? Are we going to open the door? Are we going to answer that door? Because similarity in his earthly ministry, again, I brought up that Matthew 6 passage. He says, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be open. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. So the beautiful thing about this picture that we see here on the screen, and this picture that we see in Revelation 3 of Jesus knocking at the door, is that Jesus promises that if we open the door, if we let him in, he promises that he will come in the door. Come in the door for us. And that's a great promise. He won't just ring the doorbell and knock and run away. Right? We don't get that picture. He will come in. He will dine with the believer. He will hear us. And remember, this isn't the Church of Laodicea will open the door and I will come and dine with them. But instead, it's the, if anyone will come to the door, I will come in and dine with them, including the lukewarm Christian. 
including the one who recognizes, you know what? Maybe I have been neglecting my spiritual life. Yeah, I'm a Christian, but maybe, maybe I've actually spent a little much too much time in the world and not in the Word. He's still there, going to come in and help and love on us and transform our lives. So what, what I think about that is that's just a great reality, right? What an awesome truth we can remember. And I think of even two, um, Romans 8, 1, right? Therefore, if anyone, sorry, that's a different passage. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ, right? Even the lukewarm Christian, if they truly are saved and, and they just have their priorities mixed up, they're still in Christ. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ. That's the beautiful, beautiful part about eternal security is that if we are truly saved and transformed, there's going to be times and seasons in our lives where we maybe fall on the ground, may struggle to get back up, maybe even dabbling in a different avenue. But if we're still in Christ, if we are truly saved, there's no condemnation. Our identity is still found in him. And all of this is true because this last promise is really to the overcomer. And even at Laodicea, it shows that we don't have to be Christians who are compromising and lukewarm in our lives. But even if we are, we can change. And really our change, us changing, us changing, is really him changing us. It's the beautiful element of the Spirit, that the Spirit transforms our lives. And that we can overcome the spirit of lukewarmness or the spirit of Laodicea if we're ever found that we are in a season of Laodicea. It's never too late to come to Christ. It's never too late to trust that Christ died for our sins. It's never too late to turning our lives back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the big thing we have to trust in is this fancy theological term here of substitutionary atonement, that Christ became our substitute, that he died on the cross for our sins. Because the wages of sin is death. Death came into the world, and death spread through one man because all men have sinned. But as one man brought death into the world, one man also brought life and peace and joy, who became our substitute on the cross, who died on the cross for our sins in my place, in your place. And that is the hope of the gospel right there. That is the hope that can transform our broken, sinful lives, our broken, sinful culture, and restore it back to what God has intended us to be. And yes, in our world, that's the danger of Laodicea too, is that there is sin everywhere we look. And if we're not following Christ, we're going to, at one time or the other, fall into our own sinful flesh, our own sinful nature. The beautiful element of the gospel is that Jesus transforms our life from ourselves from our own sin. Because if we're being honest with ourselves, we want to be saved from ourselves. Amen. <laughs> we want a new life. We want a new way to think. And that's the beautiful part about this personal relationship that Jesus Christ offers us. Is believe that he became our substitute on the cross. Believe that he died in our place. He who knew no sin became that sin that we are so that we may become the righteousness of God, that we may be transformed back into the creation in which God has intended us to be. So that is the seven churches. That is future, but there's always some great things that even our local church here in Indianapolis can learn from, to be reminded of, to be challenged by, but most importantly, be transformed by. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, Reminded of the, the dangers of this Laodicean spirit, but also the encouragement that, uh, for being honest, we've all maybe been in seasons of this before. And uh, the beautiful element of this is that there's no condemnation if we are truly in Christ. Father, let our hearts and our minds and our priorities be transformed away from the coldness, away from the lukewarmness, 
Let us be hot, on fire, people for you. Zealous to do good works. Not to save us or to keep us saved, but because we are saved. Because we have a new life in you. Father, I'm thankful for my friends and family here at this church who make church a priority, who want to grow more in your word, who are faithful to not only the body of Christ, but faithful to you, faithful to one another, faithful to me, who live out loving God and loving others. Keep them on this path that you have called them on. Keep myself on this path that you've called me on. Father, bless this time in your grace and your goodness. In your holy name we pray. Amen. In this crazy world of the believer, I trust you're all believers here. Aren't you glad that Jesus loves us? We're going to close today with two verses of Jesus loves even me. second. Need the words. No problem. We just roll with it. Here we go. All right. Introduction, please. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of his love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Though I forget him and wander away, still he doth love me wherever I stray. Back to his dear loving arms would I flee when I remember that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Thank you, and you are dismissed.